As day camps continue to rebound from the pandemic, inflation is hitting hard and we just can't raise prices as much as our costs are increasing. So what then? Well, we can look at our policies for registrations and refunds and get our camp families to play by new rules so that we can maximize our revenue and keep enough money in the bank to pay our staff and everything else. Who better to preach the virtues of fiscal understanding than the always opinionated Mr. Jonathan Gold? This is the Day Camp Pot. Welcome back to the Day Camp Podcast. I'm Andy Pritikin, Director of Liberty Lake in the Philly suburbs of New Jersey. I'm Sam Thompson from Crystal Lake Park District, Crystal Lake, Illinois. And I'm Tiffany Gratton McDuffie, owner of Purposeful Play in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And we are back with another awesome episode of the Day Camp Podcast with um, returning guest, longtime returning guest, Jonathan Gold, coming to us from the, the, um, the state of Florida which is interesting yeah. unto itself, but super interesting today because he's awaiting a hurricane. Well, well actually, I think the hurricane hit already, but <laughs> I'll hit the we're, other just seeing, we're just seeing if there's any aftermath, but I'm on the East Coast, so it's not that bad. That's great. So uh, Jonathan uh, is the, uh, I guess we call him the CEO of the Arbor Group. He is a longtime camp, day camp operator and director at, um, at a bunch of camps, but uh, the latest, biggest one being Oak Crest Day Camp. And then he picked up uh, Pine Grove and Tamarack in the last decade or so, too. So Jonathan, uh, juggling three camps this summer. Um, can you give us your overall, how was your summer for the three camps, especially compared to 2021? I mean, there were different challenges. I would say it was easier than 2021. 2021 was pretty hard. Um, I think the staffing stuff was extremely challenging. Um, I, I think I told you this before, but I'll, I'll say it in the podcast. So we did an analysis of what percent of staff actually worked 39 days this summer, just from the payroll records, not like, okay, you were supposed to work six weeks and you worked you know, 28 days, but how, like, how, what percent of staff actually worked the entire full summer? And we averaged, and I got to believe this is going to be true around statewide, we averaged out somewhere around 40, 35 to 40% between the three camps. So that's a very different model of staffing than anything we've ever been used to. Even, even going back to 2019, I haven't ever done the analysis before, but I wanted to see what it was like. So, uh, you know, that, that really changes a lot of basic assumptions for all of us, um, if that's holding true. I just think that the, the eight-week or seven-week model for resident camp or eight-week model for staff working day camp, I think that's, that's pretty much a thing of the past, mostly. Going the way the dodo burn? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you got you to gotta be real. And, but that's the bad news. The good news is parents seem to be okay with it so long as you have the people, you know, to, people to, to rotate to in. Kids safe. To rotate in. Uh, so, you well, know, I think it's, it's, it's expectations, right? Yeah. I think if, if you give people the expectations, they certainly understand what's going on. You know, they understand that their restaurant isn't open today <laughs> and, that, and that, you know, that the Starbucks over there closes at five now because they yeah. just can't have people staff it. Um, so yeah, that, that is definitely a, a podcast unto itself. Uh, there's no doubt about it. I, I had told Jonathan when he told me this bit of information that at Liberty Lake, we do a bonus. Well, we, we, we do, a, um, we give people a $10 Wawa card that just shows you where I'm at um, in here in greater Philly area. Um, if they're, if they have perfect attendance for the first four weeks of camp, and then we do it for the second four weeks of camp. And then if they have, have achieved both, we put their name in a hat and on the last day of camp at the final assembly, I get this little cute little preschooler to reach in and pull it out. And we give that person a wad of a hundred dollar bills. Um, this year, I think we had 25 names in that hat and we had close to 300 staff. Yeah. And we have never had such a small amount of names in that hat. Um, now perfect means perfect. So if you know, even if you came in late or left early or something too, but that's uh, just just goes to show you, yeah, we have to be more flexible. All right. So anyway, that will no, be a great. Great. That will be a great other podcast. There's no doubt about staffing flexibility. All right, but we're here today to talk about staff R and R, which is not rest and relaxation. Um, we'll get into that at the next podcast, which will be a little bit about burnout and how we teach those staff R and R. But um, what we're going to talk about is registrations and refunds, because as we start 
the um, as we start the process of enrolling, and some people are even done enrolling at this point. I know it sounds crazy. Um, a lot of camps have changed their parameters. They've taken this moment post COVID to sort of pivot and get a little more aggressive and tilt the scales a little bit more towards the camp um, when we had been doing anything and everything for our, our camp families as in regards of flexibility. So, you know, in, in coming up with, uh, you know, what we do for early enrollment, do we have different price breaks? Um, you know, wh what's the deal with refunds? When do you not get your money back? How about making changes? So I wanna get into that a little bit, but. Um, but first, I wanted Jonathan, who um, who was actually a professor, a business professor at the collegiate level, uh, million years ago. <laughs> but but also is is certainly a student of economics um, and 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 what's going on in this country at this time. So if you could just give us the little macroeconomic overview of, of what, what you think is going on, Jonathan, and, and how it affects camps, um, state of the union kind of thing. Well, I think it's a very it's a very interesting time because um, I'm a big proponent of if you're running a camp, you sort of have to try to look at the horizon and see what's coming. But um, it's very difficult right now because we're, I feel like um, the, the leading economic indicators now are all trending down, uh, but the Fed is still in a tightening phase. So, so I'm, I'm going to start at the very beginning and say, you know, assume that your people know you know, monetary versus fiscal policy. Monetary, should I do a quick, quick thing, Andy, on this? Like monetary policy being the control of the money supply and interest rates, which is what the Federal Reserve does. You know, they set interest rates, they control the money supply. And I was, I was telling you the other day, um, just for example, if you're experiencing a lot of inflation, a little interesting fact is that um, about 20, uh, 80, 20% of the dollars currently in circulation were printed this year in 2022, which makes a lot of sense because everything is about 15 to 20% more expensive. So what, what a dollar bought a year ago is now about what 80 cents buys now, um, even though the, the official inflation rate year over year is 8.3, that's exclusive of food and energy. So it's not a real number. So we have this, this policy where the Fed determined to bring inflation down um, and we're probably looking at 7% mortgage rate soon. And then we have fiscal policy, which is what the government does. They control, you know, um, they control the tax rates and everything else. So what you're seeing happen in the current administration is a very liberal fiscal policy where they're giving back, you know, student loans and they're printing a lot of money. So we have two pieces of the government working at odds with each other. Um, one is one is sort of inflation positive with if you talk about what the administration is doing and one is inflation negative, you talk about what the Fed's doing. So it's really hard to predict uh, what's gonna happen, but so long as, as the Fed keeps seeing these strong inflation numbers, they're gonna keep raising interest rates. And overtly, I mean, you know, Powell has said this just out loud, they're looking to you know, destroy a million to 2 million jobs in the US. So that's sort of where we're looking at economically. But the, the part that's really hard for us to figure is, there's still short supply on a lot of things, which is causing them to cost more money. Number one thing being labor, right? Uh, you know, it's short, real, still really hard to find people um, and still really hard to get a lot of things, new cars, used cars. So it's really hard to predict where we are, but if you're gonna morph that into, you know, what, what that means to camp and consumer, consumer behavior and consumer you know, camp registrations, um, it's a really different topic because our experience in the pandemic has shown a lot of people that, you know, everything we, you and I and all of us have preached for the last 10 years was more true than ever, right? You know, the kids need play, they need the social interaction, they need to get the success of camp, they need all the great things that camp provides. And at least in New Jersey right now, I don't think there are enough day camps for the population, like traditional day camps for the population. I just right. think that, that- Demand, demand far exceeds- Exceeds supply, supply. right? So, so in, our, in our three camps, we had a lot of discussion on this during the summer about what we were going to do with rates. And my, my constant mantra to my directors was, you know, people are expecting a significant rate increase. We should not disappoint them uh, because, because everything else was up, you know, 8, 10, 15 percent. Uh, and, and so we all did that. I, I, most camps have done somewhere between 5 and 10 percent from what I can see. 
and most camps are, are have, have really healthy registration. What does that mean if the economy all of a sudden goes south? Do uh, you remember, Andy, what happened in 2008 when we were, you know, when the, when the housing bubble popped and um, we were, I, I remember this really distinctly, we were at Tri-State and there was like this meeting and they were going to bring in a PR firm to try to bump up camp demand. You remember this? Like, yeah. uh, uh, and, and uh, you know, everybody was freaking out because there were so many refund requests going on and people were writing checks. I mean, it, you know, it didn't hold a candle to what happened in COVID, but you know, it was still, it was still bad. So I think we might see a lot of turnover uh, going into the spring if the economy slows down as much as the Fed tries to get it to slow down. But I don't know. Uh, it, it's tough. Though. Basically, what I'm trying to say is a tough, tough year to predict what's going right. to happen. Right. So, so segueing that to our topic, the if everything that we buy costs significantly more, including labor, right? We're in New Jersey. Minimum wage keeps on getting ratcheted up. You know, dollar a year. Um, and, and let's interject. Let's interject that regardless of what Trenton says about the minimum wage, the prevailing minimum wage is not what Trenton says. It's what it's what Panera's paying, right? Right, and Starbucks, and, and, and who are we right. competing with? Right. So, the, so it's not even what what Trenton says minimum wage is prevailing. I was I for years worked on the on the other side of the coin trying to trying to stop the minimum wage law from happening and because I'm a free market guy. Now, now I'm living by the sword, die by the sword. We have, we're going to have to pay more yeah. because that's what the market says. No, it's true. And, and, you know, five miles from me is Pennsylvania, where it's the federal minimum wage of only like seven twenty five an hour. But of course, nobody's making seven twenty five an hour there. You know, it's the same thing. It's, uh, Are it's you what, drawing a lot of staff from there? No, no. Okay. Um, but uh, I, I need to. That's a whole other story. All right, so, so we can't raise our rates to the level that our expenses are raising, right? So we need to maximize what we have and what we can do. And, you know, from my perspective, I started this camp, Tiff started her camps, right? Where you're just trying to get kids in and you're doing whatever you got to do to roll out that red carpet and give people, you know, the confidence that you're not going to keep their money and all that kind of thing if you know if they change their minds and stuff like that and now um i can't do that anymore i can't afford to do that anymore um fortunately enrollment's good enough that i can get a little cocky with it and get a little aggressive with it too and um you know and as i surveyed camp directors this summer when i was trying to figure out what to do i i started seeing that what was going on and there's a lot of a lot of camps have have adjusted their their ways to be a little bit more aggressive um, be, because there's only so much that we can do right we're not going to understaff right purposely <laughs> it creates an unsafe situation um, certainly yeah we're not we might not put as much capital into our facilities and things like that those who those people who own their facilities um, but besides that like we're there's not that many places to cut because your big expenses are you know, uh, staffing, transportation, if you do that, you're sort of stuck with that. Um, so, so you have to take those dollars that are coming in and maximize them. So, so with the Arbor Group, just, um, Jonathan, what were, what were some of the conversations as far as, uh, as realigning and, and, and messing with your enrollment process this summer? Was there any? Uh, w- no, we've gotten certainly, you know, we got, we got a lot tougher with, with deposit and overall refunds. I mean, our, our refund date you know, has moved around a lot, but a lot of that was also COVID. I mean, you got to remember like the year after COVID, Mm -hmm. people, which was last year, 2021, you know, even though we all, we all got filled up very quickly, you know, we, we weren't going into that summer. We weren't sure whether people were going to flood back into camp a hundred percent and, and, you know, COVID could still raise it. So, so I think a lot of us had a little bit more flexibility in the refund policies. Then, you know, the tables quick flip quickly. So we're 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 now in April one hard refund deadline date, mm-hmm. um, you know, and um, you know if somebody, if, if honestly we 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 push the Travmark insurance uh, if they want to if they want to hedge on their investment, um, but if somebody if somebody all of a sudden gets transferred and moves and they've been a customer for eight or nine years and you know they only have wonderful things to say about your camp, you know, you're probably going to give them something back if it's June one and they got you know transferred to Chicago and 
Yeah. Well, let, let me interrupt with that a second, because I don't think a lot of people know what Travmark Insurance is. So, so when Jonathan gets you to sign up at his camp, he offers an insurance policy for people if they cancel, right? Can you just encapsulate that so people? Yeah, it's it's um, it? you pay up, you pay an extra. It's just like exactly the same as trip insurance. In fact, it's a trip insurance company. Um, fewer and fewer people are taking it, Andy. By the way. Mm -hmm. uh but we 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 throw it out there and say hey you know what um that way if you come back to us in you know the end of may and say oh i don't want to come to camp anymore you know our first question is well did you buy the, the travel insurance um and, and, the, and uh, this is this is relevant for people after april 1st for you april 1st yeah right yeah, after april 1st so um you know they can buy the cancel for any reason and and they can get i think most of their money back uh so i don't know I don't know. It's uh, but not a lot of people are taking it, so it's not really that relevant. Can you just give people a ballpark of what it costs? So if it's a three thousand dollar enrollment or something, like is it a percentage? Yeah, it's, it's it usually is. It's 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 dollar. I think the cancel for any reason is up over like two three hundred dollars now for somewhere six to eight weeks. Uh, it might even be more than that this year. I don't know. Um, but it's, like I said, it's not that relevant for us because not a lot of people are choosing it anymore. Mm -hmm. um they're just not taking it they're just they're just dealing with whatever and trying to make their make their plan so it comes in it comes in in you know it comes in, it doesn't come into play heavily but refunds certainly come into play heavily uh you know come springtime a lot in my clientele particularly at Oakcrest, a lot of my people decide to change their plans um you know, a lot of teens change their plans. So refund oh, yeah. policy is, yeah, no, is really is relevant. A big deal. But let, I want to, I want to sort of go along the timeline. Let's start with early enrollment. Mm -hmm. Right. So in this day and age where people are signing up, you know, because th there's a scarcity issue, like you mentioned. Yes. Yeah. Right. I don't know what you're experiencing in Chicago and Milwaukee, Tiff, but like, like John's is saying in, in, in the, in the suburbs, there is definitely a scarcity thing and people are signing up because they don't want to get closed out. Correct. So my question is like, is it is it then smart to to decrease your value for incentivizing people to sign up early when there's a scarcity issue and they're signing up early anyway? Well, uh, so this is I'll tell you how we handled it. Um, we start we actually you know we used to do a whole lot of rate breaks like you know a lot of clubs did, and then this this past year uh, as soon as we open enrollment we had just a quota, an immediate quota on where we were at, uh, which we hit, you know, I don't know, very, very quickly for the, for the, you know, super preferential, you know, super early bird rate. And, um, and then we closed it out. And this was like before the end of camp. I mean, we started, we started, I think like the, third, the Monday of the third week of camp was when we opened enrollment. And I think by Wednesday or Thursday, that, that early bird moment was done. Uh, and then we, we immediately bumped rates while that was happening into the next rate break uh, because, you so know, you I started, I, you started enrollment in July for the no, next summer, for the first week in August. Oh, the first, first week in August. August. All right. So we ended the third week in August and we end that early enrollment at the end of camp. Um, but a lot of camps do that. And um, we took in, we took in the deposits. Uh, you know, a lot, you know, we didn't have a chance to process everything through Camp Minder until the after camp ended. But, um, you know, it was very solid all the way through, but never in, never in the history of camp and of doing this before, did we ever bump that rate up before the end of early enrollment. And we bumped it up this year after like four days. Uh -huh. Right. So you're sort of answering my question that, yeah, you were sort of remiss that you, that you, that you put such a low number at first. Right. Yeah. Well, it just we had a quota. We just had a quota, and as soon as we hit the quota, we we bumped. Mm -hmm. You know, that was it. I said, this is this is all I'm taking at this rate, and and I base. So if you want to get if you want to get like really granular, um, so I I spend the fifth weekend of camp going through. It's really kind of not so much fun, but I kind of like it. So, but um, <laughs> you know, I'm weird. But you take your comparative financials. Take a look at your, your income statement for from the year before. Take a look at where you are at that point in the summer and guesstimate based on the cost increases where you might be in the following summer. It is a really, really long reach to try to figure that out because, you know, based on, on the current rate of inflation and is it going to stay the same and what's going to happen and what are the other market forces. 
But, um, you know, you start taking a look at your numbers and saying, okay, what can I live with? What's a revenue number that I want to I wanna get to? And if I want to get to, let's just pick a number I've had. If I want to get to a $5 million, $6 million gross, um, then what, what, therefore, it's an, it becomes an algebra equation. What then has to be true? Um, you know what your rough capacity is. You know what your average sale is. You know, okay, well, I only want to take X amount of campers at this rate and then cut off because I need to have room for the subsequent rates. And I, I, you know, I know that it's, it's like very gratifying for a lot of people to like sort of beat their chest to say, oh my God, we were closed out by September 1st, but it's not always the best thing. Um, it's not always the best thing to do that because you really want to leave some room at the end. And I know you're going to have turnover from people that are pulling out, but those like rack retail rates that you get in April and May, when you're really upcharging people, all that extra revenue is going right to the bottom line. So, um, yeah, well, that, yeah, that's we, exactly what I'm talking about um, yeah. with my question, because when I worked with Jay Jacobs over at North Shore and the Timberlake camps, um, you know, we were coming out of the Ben Applebaum age where we literally had four different price breaks from right. August through whatever. Um, and, and the price breaks were good because at the time, you know, to have four opportunities to be like, hey, the price is going up. You know, that would get people yep. push them over the fence. Yeah. Right. And but that's JJ, a, that's a, and, and nobody cares about that anymore. Right. But meanwhile, he was running these sleeper <laughs> camps that were filling up. And um, and he was like, we don't need to do that. This is the price. Right. Because he was he was taking advantage of scarcity at a at a at a right. popular sleepaway camp right so um that's what we went to we went to the this is the price model and it's been fine and yeah. and when i say early enrollment now to people it just means i'm letting you into enroll now and you getting an opportunity to actually get a spot because you're not going to get one down the road and uh and, and that's that um uh, curious, uh, Sam and Tiff, what are you guys doing with with your with your places as far as opening the opening the doors? You know, are you starting earlier? Are you reducing the price, et cetera, et cetera? Okay, so being municipal, um, most of the park districts and city parks and that kind of thing uh, start their um, registration in February. Um, a lot of them did fill by I know mine filled by April. And then we had wait lists, which I limited to six per session per camp, um, because after the, you, you know you're only going to have so many people change around. So I didn't want a ton of people waiting on the wait list. So we had these big wait lists in May, and then we didn't run into anybody getting off the wait list until mid to end of summer, and then. At that point, our policy was just, sure, we'll give you a full refund and then we'll call the guy on the list. But guess what? The guy on the list already made other plans. Um, so then we weren't recouping that money at all. So we are changing um, our refund policy that they're either paying half or they're, if they're backing out for some reason, they're backing out really early so that we can pull off the wait list and, and still have that spot filled. But um, I'm listening to all your guys' suggestions because I'm just formulating that new plan. Um, but yes, it used to be that we'd do anything for anybody. And then during COVID, it was all medical. So of course we refunded. And now we're at the point where it's like, no, you signed up for 10 weeks. I still need that spot. Well, and, and I'm wondering, Tiff, for a municipal program, if you know, think about what it was last year, right? Where people were clamoring, you know, and in two months you guys were, were filled up um, like never before. If places like Banner and Tamarack, and I don't know who you compete with with the private camps down there, um, but if they're all getting filled up, you know, like there's gonna be a line out the door. When you tell people that we're, op we're opening registration at 10 a.m. on this date, like, like it's gonna be like getting concert tickets. Yeah. Yeah, for me, my my camp is just is just different because we're predominantly funded and sub subsidized through government funding, and so we do require a deposit like we always have. We we used to waive it sometimes based on people's like economic conditions. We don't do that anymore. So they are <clears throat> clamoring to like make sure that their space is saved, and because we typically have families with multiple children, that's been a really big push. But we we rarely had issues of needing to refund money. One thing I will say is that 
in in years past when we were at the park location because we had a lot bigger capacity um this was not this was a non-issue we could just take more and more kids but now that we've moved to our building and we do have more of a limited capacity um we we stay full so i guess the biggest shift for us is just knowing like if you make a deposit it's a commitment and it's not refundable we don't even have a it can be refunded after a certain period of time because the parents portion is so low if you if you take a space you you're required to either um bring your children or um or it's not refundable. So it's a quite different business model from like how we're funded. And so this is interesting to hear. One thing that stood out for me though, I love um, geeking out on numbers as well. So I love that Jonathan was doing this like year over year comparison of not only, um, you know, also of staff, right? Like how long, what their staying power is. And I think that we used to be able to, um, pride ourselves on having continuity of care you know these are the coaches who are here all year they've been here for years etc and so just really learning to navigate that for us has been very interesting and our um savings or like money management has more so been on that side like how do we manage how do we incentivize our staff to have more staying power so we do things similar like what you were talking about Andy where if you meet this metric then you're rewarded if you meet this metric then you're rewarded and and so forth and we really have um there's they get also bonuses for going above and beyond so doing things outside of the regular camping role to kind of give them a feel of what it would look like to own and manage a camp my adjustments have really been far more on the staff side and the expense side what's needed and what's not needed as opposed to the revenue side because that's always been pretty you know knock on wood pretty pretty steady but listening to you all I think of like what it would be like to open a new camp somewhere else that isn't you know predominantly government funded and so these are amazing tips that I appreciate um last thing I'll say when Jonathan said <laughs> it made me chuckle but it's such big facts um the state or municipal minimum wage is the minimum wage it's your competitors all around it's what the market is demanding right and that goes back to this whole thing with staff if people feel like they you know day camp has always been a grind a bit of a grind you know it's long days it's meaningful it's purposeful so they stay for that reason but um if they're if you're not great at creating the culture where people want to stay and leaning into the change that they're making you will lose somebody to Panera where they can sit down and you know heat Working up the in the yeah. yeah 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 no, the phone tough, whenever they want yeah it's a tough sell to, this is this is what I think it's a really tough sell to people who don't know camp right which is always every year a decent portion of your staff it's a very tough sell to say to somebody you're going to be and as, as aptly put Andy by Justin you're going to be you know dragging a group of third grade boys around in 100 degree heat you know and and it's just hard to get up for the next day because you know you're missing out on hanging out with your friends whereas you could probably make similar money working 20 hours a week for Amazon and call your own shots and work the hours and go to the beach on the weekend so it's it's just a tough sell for staff but I, I know that's another topic for um yeah for you know, no, but but when no but relevant to this topic, uh, when I budgeted, when I sat down in July and did that, um, I was looking at a hourly rate in New Jersey significantly above what prevailing minimum wage is, because I was anticipating. Now, if it doesn't work that way, it doesn't work that way. But I was anticipating uh, the tight labor market to continue and realizing that we just have to pay up for staff now. I mean like end of story we just have to yeah. pay up for them there's yeah. no there's no way around it and, and, and which leads you to for, a better for oh i'm sorry which leads you to to how you know you have to be more stringent in your refund policy right it leads you to know that it's non-negotiable right. that you have to pay more so if we want our businesses to be viable then you know you have to um be willing to change your refund policy and and the other thing is it's more of a, a mindset issue can I do it? What's going to happen? What are they going to say? All of the thoughts and fears that pop up for owners, like, am I going to lose people? And I think you all have already answered that with like, no, this, there's no need for that scarcely thinking from an ownership perspective, because 
the demand is there. People want their kids up and out of the house, not only for the benefit that it brings to the kids, but for their own sanity, yeah. right? Because they don't have they don't have yeah. space and time anymore. They're working well, at home. And so they want their kids out. The demand is there. So I, it is an opportunity for us to capitalize so, revenue. To your point, to your point directly, uh, you know, we went back to like, you know, pre-COVID everything this year, you know, camp show, intercamp competition. Like we just went back to pre-COVID everything. And the number one question I would get for parents if we were doing like an evening event or, you know, a visiting day event or whatever it was, the number one question I would get was, is there wine? <laughs> Like, are are you serving alcohol at this event? And uh, and we actually, at one of our camp shows, we had an evening event. We actually broke out a wine bar, and it was like huge. <laughs> it, was, it was huge. I, you know, I think I think when you get older, Andy, you just say, "What the hell? You just gonna do whatever?" But uh, yeah, we broke out the wine bar, and parents were like all buzzing about it. And it was right before early enrollment too, so it worked out really well. And that's what I mean around just creating a culture where registration and, you know, refunds are really a non-issue because when you do things like that, it becomes more familial. They feel more involved. You know, like it's all around creating this buzz of this is what happens here. And so then it's an easy switch. When the prices go up, they get it because they already feel like they belong. They like, know, and trust you. So it makes it easier. Agreed. And, and I think, Andy, your point on setting expectations is also huge. Um, and it translates, uh, it also translates to staff. And, and so, again, to connect the refund and the staff thing again. Um, when, when COVID hit and we got commitments from staff in I think April or May of that year, I felt that a lot of those commitments, we didn't know how many kids we were going to take. We didn't know whether we were going to get open, but I needed to know who was coming and who was committed. We had this conversation, right? So we laid out what the expectations were. We, we really tried to, to uh, reduce expectations. And we also contacted as much as we could, every staff member who had committed to us, we contacted their parents to say, hey, your child's committing. If they're not going to come because of COVID, I get it. I understand it's a big decision. We just need to know, right? So the same thing is true of refunds. You have to communicate probably five or six different times in multiple different ways. Hey, the teen refund is now February 1. We're going to start making commitments on trips and tickets and everything else. And there are no refunds after the state. You can't just throw it out one time. Um, you really have to do it. And you're still going to get, I mean, I don't know about you guys. You're still going to get people who are like, well, can I get a refund for these two days because we decided to go to the shore Thursday and Friday? And, you know, my answer is always one of two things. Well, if you can find me another camper for those two days and they'll pay me what you were going to go, I'll, I'll be happy to give you a refund. Or um, if I'm, if I'm a little more snarky and it's been a long day, I might say, so when you go on vacation from your house and you go away, do you ask your bank to not pay your full mortgage that month? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, it's, these are all fixed costs once you commit to them, whether you decide to use your house or not because you're on vacation, that's a personal choice, right? Whether you decide to use your camp days or not, that's a personal choice. But once you've committed, you've committed. Um, and it's not like we save any money because your kid's not there to that, you know, the, the $15 in food or whatever it is for that day. So that's sort of like, and, and a lot of that has to be communicated because I think people still feel like we're a little bit of the hotel. You know, I only stayed five yeah. days. I should only pay five days. Yeah. I want to tell you all about CRS, Commercial Recreation Specialists, the fine purveyors of the best recreation solutions to keep camp going strong. Check out their website, crs4rec.com, because CRS is serious about fun. And they have an awesome disc golf thing. You know, as we're going back to old school things and Gaga and Foursquare and wall ball and, and pickleball now, like all these uh, things have become the range. Disc golf. Is, uh, is another one that is making a huge comeback and they have a tremendous, tremendous setup for it. So check them out at your next camp conference or online at crs4rec.com because Rich Wills and the folks in New Jersey and Wisconsin, they do a bang up job and they're huge, huge um, 
um, just, you know, great supporters of, uh, of the American Camp Association, the Day Camp Podcast, and everything else that's due to camp. So that's that's my that's my take on that. All right, so back to what we were talking about. I wanted to um, I wanted to just hit on something for Sam and Tip because you know there's a tremendous amount of people that listen to Day Camp Pod that are not private day camp people like Jonathan and I, um, and I just want to talk about the aspect of. Um, when because you guys still have the same issues like we were just talking about like prevailing wage is prevailing wage right gas costs the same for you guys as the cost for us uh, electricity all those kind of things um and when you are reliant on government grants okay when you are reliant on a a, a, a municipal budget th those dollars it like it, people can't treat them the same way that they used to be anymore and, you know, we deal with some state funding and, you know, like when we allocate a, a spot for a kid and then the kid doesn't show up, we want to charge the state because that's a spot and we could have filled it with a different kid and, and we get into arguments and such with them. And on the municipal level too, like you have to now every year be raising your budgets far beyond what they want to hear, you know, just like a school does. Um, I'm just wondering, like, if you guys are encountering any issues like this, that you you have to tighten up your things um, and such, because every every dollar matters and you have to start thinking a little more aggressively, like a, like private camps would, you know, like we we're talking about refunds and such. Andy, for park districts, um, I believe most uh, camps are have to be self-sufficient. They can't use any tax money because the seniors who are paying taxes don't use that and they they would definitely be upset by that. So um, all of our childcare things are user based. Um, with that being said, though, I am I am a, a license exempt to our state. And so I do receive a low income children who they pay for. Um, if a low income child who's on my docket doesn't show up 80% of the time, they bring everyone's numbers down and then I don't get paid fully for everybody. So if they're not showing up, I'm following up really quickly on that because I don't want them to um, bring everyone else down. So in that regards, yes, it, it's going to affect my money coming from the state when I have those families. Yes, yeah, similar. If they don't come for over 30 days, then the state stops paying and we have to report that. So I just use the deposit and I'm just very stringent on the deposit. Like I said, we used to do it kind of basically touchy feely or like everybody didn't have to, but now we make it so that the deposit is a non-negotiable if you want your space, just really so they have some skin in the game. Because it's easy when you're spending someone else's money to be like, you know, no, we're not coming or we don't feel like it or we woke up late or whatever the issue may be. But um, right. I That's really interesting. The mm -hmm. deposit, because we hear from a lot of the, the folks like that, they say we don't have enough money for a deposit right now, cool. especially yeah. think, especially think about us. We're sitting here and rolling people, you know, eight months out, nine months out, 10 months out. Mm -hmm. you know and and that's a that's an interesting too uh question too did you guys raise your deposits um, i did yeah i raised my deposits because from that perspective of just wanting to have some skin in the game and my parents you know they pay for all sorts of stuff right the hair is done the lashes are done the nails are fancy like they can pay for what they want and so if you want your child to have the stellar experience then it's worth it and i think that's why i said it's a mindset shift just from like oh my gosh they don't have it or they're gonna say no to just like really standing on this is what happens here this is the culture we're creating this is the experience your children will have and this is what it costs and really just like saying it very matter of factly um if you make it a big deal in your head it'll be a big deal for them but otherwise i mean it's been working and what are your deposits right now tiff so there, it, it ranges based on how long that they're going to be enrolled in camp, mm -hmm. but it's about 40% um, of the of the camp costs. That's significant. Mm -hmm. and, and you say 40% of, but you, if you're subsidized, it, are, the, are they going to get a refund if they're, so it, how do you do once that? They, when they enroll, when they actually come to camp, they get, they get, um, 
almost almost 30 percent of it back so it's really like 10 percent. but we when we were just doing like 125 twenty-five dollar deposit or 10 percent of the full camp enrollment mm -hmm. they were they were not coming so it's 40 percent. it's 40 percent for three weeks of camp and that's how long our sessions last each time now so it's not crazy it's not undoable parents do it and you know when we when we said they didn't have to they didn't and they didn't show up now we said they have to and they do it and they show up hmm. interesting I don't have any deposits, Andy. Whatever they sign up for, they pay for in full when they sign up. At that moment. At that moment. Right. They write a big check. Which used to work out okay. They could budget and do it a couple of weeks in advance mm -hmm. and without getting late fees. But now we're full. So they've got to either pay for what they need, you know, in March or they may not get a spot. Interesting. With the change of the landscape of, uh, you know, supply and demand at camp, um, I mean, you you signing up kids in April, that seems to be the earliest I've ever heard of a municipal program signing up. Does anybody sign up earlier than that? Any other uh, programs that you know? I've heard February. Um, I haven't heard any earlier than that. Mm -hmm. so, so our deposits used to be $100 per week, and now they're $150 per week. And um, like Tiff, like you're saying, we have these kids that come through um, a program for kids with disabilities. And we, uh, the the government uh, will pay eight hundred dollars towards that kid's tuition. Um, it, so a lot of people just like are are hoping that we, they don't have to pay a deposit, but we're like, no, you need to pay a deposit up front. And if that's you know three hundred bucks for two weeks or whatever, if it's more, and um, and it is a little bit of a battle. And then when we do get the 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 check from the government, it usually is around now. It's in the fall, and then we you know we, we we try to do is say well you can use that towards next year you know kind of thing but yeah i mean theoretically we could uh, uh refund them too if it if it came to that but it's an interesting thing you know the timing of all of that the government um, always runs a month behind we we ask for money up front before they come and then the month after they come so i just got my checks for august um for the government's portion of what right. they paid yeah we're we're in that process right now and they miss some people and there's red tape and then you're talking to government workers it's a whole it it's a whole be, thing it used to be retroactive for us as well but now they pay before but so they changed the market standards to meet market demand because i think that a lot of people who received the benefit were getting closed out so they pay ahead of time but still if i want to do early enrollment um they're not paying for that but if you know, for October, for after school, they're paying October 1st for the rest of the month. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So, so Jonathan, I'm, I'm hoping uh, is not off because of a storm, <laughs> because of hurricane, whatever it is, but I'm going to take a moment and talk about captivities. And hopefully when we're done, we'll have Jonathan back for the tail end of this thing. Um, so anyway, our friends at Camptivities, uh, Ryan Rosen and the crew out there in California, they are big uh, supporters of the Day Camp Pod as well as the Camp Owners Pod. And, uh, you know, as they say that, you know, th this is their product came from a need that they found that they were spending too much time handwriting programs. So they put their ingenuity to work and they came up with a camp activity scheduler right that will have all the nuances and details to scheduling that they do without you know um it, when you're using a pencil uh, on paper too so um you quickly search through your camp activity scheduler and you come across camp activities and um, you've got group scheduling camper scheduling batch scheduling and you can do manual adjustments elective scheduling tons of customized settings um with uh you know over 50 reports to work with. So um, think about your organizational continuity and stop relying on one person to make your summer schedule. So that's another issue there too. If something happens to that one person, it could be bad. Um, so they'd love to show you how to do it. So don't wait, start the onboarding process now. Um, do what I did and uh, visit camptivities.com, set up a time to chat and they'll do a whole thing where they take over your computer and they'll show you how neat it is. All right. So it's camptivities.com. Thanks a lot. All right. And we got Jonathan back. The storm has not made it there. <laughs> yep, just, just a little power bump. <laughs> That's the grid, Jonathan. It's all about the grid. It's all about all the right. grid. So, so, um, so, so just segueing out into um, into the end of this thing now. So, 
we, we talked about, you know, early enrollment for, for the private camps to do that kind of thing of not changing the fees necessarily if you don't have to. Um, then there's early payment too. So we used to do, we used to do an early payment schedule and it really helped us with the cash flow. But now that camp is filling up, we are making it nominal. We're making it like a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, as opposed to like five percent, is what I used to do. Um, and and then, um, but what I really want to talk about is the um, is the whole thing that we encountered last year is that when you have a filled camp and then people want to drop, right? And that leaves you with gaps. And whether you have a waiting list or not, a lot of the people on the waiting list have already made other choices at that point and now you and you don't want to get left with a gap day camps now have become like sleepaway camps where a bed is that valuable and you don't want to give that spot up so i'm curious what you guys do to um encourage be, besides saying like jonathan okay after april 1st you can't make any changes or something like that like are there any other mental tricks that you're doing with people um i know jonathan you do um with your payment schedule you do installments along the way right right so so um our font real not not so much anymore Andy. <laughs> to be clear so mm -hmm. you make your deposit uh and then um our final refund date is april 1 so 75 percent of your of of whatever's left of your tuition about 25 percent is due prior to that in january and that's really just a cash flow bump and um and you do get a little you, you are incentivized a little bit to, to get the money in early um, and that helps us. And then the rest of it comes in on April 1 um, and it's the same day as the refund day. I don't know about you guys, but you know, for me, I just really don't enjoy writing out those big refund checks. And my experience being that most, it, even though it actually is the exact same on your bottom line, my experience is that most people that change their minds will do it prior to paying the big check on April 1, right? That now gives you three months to fill in some of those gaps, right? So, so you're getting, you're getting the, the refunds and the pullouts in March, and there's always that percentage of the population. Maybe they didn't send their kids to camp. Maybe the plans changed or whatever it is, 20%, you know, that don't really tune into looking into camp until spring, until the weather starts getting warmer. And that kind of works well. I mean, at least, you know, it worked well for us last year. It really did. Yeah, we were before. we were we were May one last year, and we got burnt um, by a, a lot of you know we had hundreds of people on our wait list, and then most of them were you know had chosen other things right. at that point. How so how good how good how soft is your wait list list in May and June? Your wait list is very soft. Yeah, I mean those people aren't like sitting around on the edge of their seats no. going, "Oh my God, I'm waiting to no. hear the phone call from." Andy no, at unless Lake. They, unless they just called yeah. in May and June and got put on. Yeah, it, right. Yeah. So 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 yeah. we moved it back to April one too. I also put a thing on on March one. We say March one is your last day to make any um, changes. You know, like, like decreasing your enrollment that would result in a credit um, to get actual cash refund. Okay, and then April, and then between March and April, <clears throat> if you um, if you make a decrease in your enrollment, it'll be store credit, um, and our pay in full is in the middle of that. And um, and I also put a, a line in the sand. Just again, I was just sort of trying to glean best practices from all these other camps that are doing variations of this. Um, I said when they come back from the holidays in January. I, I made a day January 4th that I said I was going to be keeping deposits at that point. Because again, I just want people to start thinking about camp the same way they would think about a shore house or a cruise or something that they're planning in the summer. Because I feel like people have been using us to fill in the gaps of their summer when now that demand is so high and it's, it's so hard to get into a good camp that um, we should be seen as the shore house or the cruise, and they could be working things around us earlier. And, and I spoke to people a whole lot last year during the winter that were like, yeah, you know, we signed up for the full summer, but we only know we're coming half the summer. But they were right. waiting until that last day to tell us that because that's what I told them they could do. So why not? You know, so um, I'm shifting on them. And, you know, people aren't so happy. But um, yeah, I was going to say, how's that? See, I, I took a different, a slightly different approach, but along the same vein, right? So our first payment, which would be the 25% of your balance, is due January 4th. Mm -hmm. The thinking, again, being 
you know, if you're going to bail or you're going to pull out, um, you're going to, you know, we're going to hear from, and, and that is true. We get a lot of people to do that. Um, how I'm, I'm interested to hear, like, what was the reaction to the deposits only, you know, you give them a store credit after that, but if, if deposits are only cash refundable until January 1, yeah. I think that's an interesting idea. Well, well, an interesting thing about the, about the way people are thinking is that last summer, 60% of our campers and probably staff had never experienced pre-pandemic camp with us. So they yep. were all people that came in in 2020 and 2021. Those people are fine with anything. They're going with the flow because they're like, oh, this is great and it's new and whatever. It's my longtime people that, you know, people don't like change. And um, when we were so hokey about it and just so flexible and so like whatever, you know, and now to be like, we're militant, you know, like they're seeing that change. And of course, it doesn't feel good to it, nor does the idea, which I've actually had people say, nor does the idea of having to like scramble to get an enrollment, like you're getting concert tickets, like people aren't so into that either necessarily. Yeah. Um, but, you know, just around building the conversation, I, Jonathan said something um, Oh, when he was talking about the refunds and how he was saying like, you know, you would ordinarily think like we gave him the refund date. We don't want to talk about it no more. Almost like we're going to leave that over here. But he said, we're reminding them the refund date is coming. The refund date is coming. So that's like taking a proactive approach. And then they can't say that they didn't know that it was coming. And there's a quote I use all the time when people set boundaries. It's like the um, the only people who who fuss about you setting boundaries are the people who benefited from you not having any right? You never benefited from not having those boundaries you're putting in place now, Andy. So they may not like it, but if they want a space, then they will do it. And if you just communicate often, I think he even said why he, he did. He said, um, we're saying the refund date is coming because now we're going to make commitments to tickets and this and this and that so that they know that this isn't just because you know i'm rolling with the pandemic wave and i get all this money yay but this is like this is a business yeah. we're running it we're providing a thing and so you know it's like this is not the camp days of old you know whatever you know um, yeah. demand is everywhere we are filling up so i know acknowledging it like i know the change is here i know you don't love it but it's you know I right. didn't love the pandemic. We didn't get no. to choose. Listen, <laughs> I, 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 I agree with everything yeah. that Tish saying, but this is this is my inerrant problem, is that people don't read their emails. They yeah. don't, like people don't, right? The the open rate of our communicate our email communication with people yeah. in the off season. We text is just, them too, Andy. It's atrocious. I yeah. Say, set no, up a I, I know, but, and, and we text them too, but I don't want to be texting people unless it's like super important. Well, Otherwise I don't want to be invading their phone. But that's where they're at. They're yeah, on their yeah, phones. That's where they're at. Yeah. No, that's that's what yeah. I, we definitely have to do uh, more of because and, and getting their and attention. And it could just be a text tough. that says, read your email. Exactly. That's what we do with the staff. As, this, as controversial as this might be, I'm going to say it anyway. We have a saying at all three camps, DDKS, dads don't know shit. So <laughs> you, can, you can remind a dad 14 times that the refund date is, you know, deadline is April 1, and they will be completely clueless. You better make sure mom has gotten those texts and emails. And, you know, like, it's just it's just not all the way across the trip. But, you know, I can't tell you how many dads was like, well, when did this start? I was like, three years ago, you know, we sent you 14 <laughs> emails. Like, you know, so you got to, yeah. it's really communication and expectation is huge around this stuff. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. No, there's no doubt that that's really important. And the text message part is, is super important. And I, I could tell you from someone that investigated a lot um, and, and uses it a decent amount, especially for my staff, I have to start using it more for the camp families. It's the prices come down uh, for the software yeah. out there for like per oh, yeah. text kind of yeah. thing. So there's some reasonable ones out there. And, uh, you know, I'm a camp minder user and they have a relationship with um, with one of these text companies that I've been using. Um, yeah. so yeah, I think that's a good lesson here that you can be changing all these things and putting these lines in the sand and all this kind of stuff. But, um, but giving people the heads up is super important and just sending them an email and be like, I sent you three emails. That is not what they want. And it's got, it's got to be like 30% of your clientele, even if they got all the text messages, even if they read all the emails, what's the downside in asking, yeah. right? you have a policy, you're likely going to say no, you've been a customer there eight years, hey, Jonathan, 
Can you cut me a break? I've been a good customer. You know, there, there's a bunch of people just going to ask. You know, and they're mm-hmm. going to say that, and their their expectation is probably you're going to say no. But the, if if you say yes, it's a win. If you say no, they're no worse off than they were before. Right. Well, that's an interesting uh, that's an interesting thing. To, that's a human behavior thing, right? A yeah. lot of people don't ask, but a lot of people do ask. And sometimes my office staff gets upset, like, "Oh, can't you believe it! I I told you it. I wrote this down. We sent this thing. Right. All this kind of thing." And I'm like, "There's no downside." They're just, they're just asking. You yeah. know, There's just no say downside. no. Just say no. Yeah. You know, and, and just like they're just asking, you can just say no. Yeah, you could just no, say no. Not around able they, to do it. Oh, yeah, they're expecting you to say no most of the time, I think. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, good stuff. We're going to wrap this one up. Um, I want to thank Jonathan Gold for coming out with us, spending this time. Okay, hunker down in his bunker. Anytime, yes. <laughs> the sun, with the sun coming through with the palm trees <laughs> yeah. Yeah. as the hurricane rolls on the opposite coast. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we also want to thank the Go Camp Pro team and uh, CRS and Camptivities for allowing us to bring this podcast to you. If you like what you hear, you should subscribe to the Day Camp Pod, your favorite podcast platform. Check out our show notes and um, and the notes from all our other episodes at daycamppodcast.com, as well as contact info for the show, for Jonathan Gold, and for me and my co-hosts. Thanks for listening and making yourself a better Day Camp Pro. We'll be back in two weeks with another episode of the Day Camp Pod.